Okay, so when we talk about DNA, uh, now we're going to see like how DNA replicates. So this video is actually a little bit higher level, which is perfect for an AP biology class, possibly an honors biology class. All right, so let's go ahead and see. So here, when we talk about nucleic acids, um, and how they uh, form that sugar phosphate backbone. Like that's gonna be our key in building because that covalent bond between the phosphate group and the sugar is gonna be more like durable, more strong than the hydrogen bonds between the base pairs. So here I have a, um, a nucleotide thymine and I have a guanine nucleotide uh, as well. So what happens here is when a nucleotide is um, going to be attached or added to the growing polymer. It actually arrives or shows up with like three phosphate groups. Now, hopefully you should think to, be thinking to yourself at this point, wow, that looks very similar to ATP. If you remember, ATP has three phosphate groups um, attached to it. And in truth, ATP, the energy like molecule in cells, is actually just an... Uh, a or adenine RNA nucleotide with three phosphates. So here, this is actually called a nucleoside uh, when it has the three phosphate groups attached. So really, uh, these monomers, uh, like this guanine one here, is going to arrive carrying its own energy that will be used to build the bond between the two nucleotides. But it doesn't just happen magically. We need an enzyme. So the enzyme that we're going to use is called DNA polymerase 3. And what will happen is when these two phosphate groups are broken off, that is like an exergonic reaction, and that energy that's released will be used in an endergonic reaction to form that phosphodiester bond between the sugar and the phosphate group. So here you can see DNA polymerase 3 is going to take the next nucleoside, here it's an adenine nucleotide. The two phosphate groups uh, will be broken off, releasing some energy that'll be used to build that phosphodiester bond. And so you can see here, we started, up at the top here, we're starting, oops, okay, sorry. We're starting at that five prime end and we're adding to the three prime end of this growing polymer, right? Of this growing DNA chain. And so with this, we're adding the next nucleotide. That bond is forming between the phosphate group and the three prime um, carbon, really the hydroxyl group, but from that three prime end of that previous nucleotide. So this will continue, like in, a, in human cells, every single nucleus, like one nuclei, has, I think it's 3.2 billion base pairs. So we have enormous amounts of nucleotides in every single cell. Um, and so this will continue for quite a while. Anyway, so here you can see that you attach the new nucleotide to the three prime end. So when we reference this, we can see that this growing uh, chain is built from the five prime end towards the three prime end. So go, it's built in the five prime to three prime direction is really how you phrase it. But now let's look at that other side. If the nuclei, okay, so we built the DNA strand in the five prime to three prime direction. Now, if the next, oh, remember, DNA is anti-parallel. The two strands run in opposite directions. So if the new nucleotide were to show up, oh, look at it upside down, okay. So if we were to build it, in the same direction as that previous strand, that like here, this cytosine or C nucleotide that just arrived, uh, the energy is not in the right place to build the bond. You can see here that the enzyme DNA polymerase three is not able to harvest or take that energy to build the new phosphodiester bond. So you can't attach DNA from three prime to five prime. It just won't work. So instead, we actually will build it in the opposite direction of the other strand so that it is built from five to three. So here it's just going in the opposite direction, but it's the same thing that happened on the previous slide. Okay, so, uh, but what about when you get here, right? Like in this, oh, just kidding. So DNA polymerase three is the enzyme that adds 
the nucleotides to the growing strand. But if you remember that spot, uh, there was no energy to form that phosphodiester bond. And so there's a separate enzyme called ligase that we'll see again towards the end of this uh, video. Ligase is going to like be like, a, you can think about it as like scotch tape or like a welder. It's gonna come and build that last little bond between the two nucleotides. So ligase is an enzyme that builds a phosphodiester bond between the two nucleotides. Uh, okay, so so now this strand was built in the five prime to three prime direction, and you can see that they're anti-parallel. All right, so let's now go through the whole process, like more specifically of how and why and when does DNA replicate. So when we think about the big picture, oh, but first let's identify our five prime and three prime ends, and because DNA is anti-parallel, you can expect the three prime up here and the five prime over there. Now, um, if you are in AP Bio, then you learned in unit four uh, about something called the cell cycle. And during the cell cycle, uh, the cell exists in G1, but when it gets a message to divide, every daughter cell made by mitosis needs to have identical copies of the DNA. So this is the why that DNA replicates. Like, why does DNA replicate? Well, if your cells are dividing, you need to make sure that each daughter cell has an exact copy of the DNA. So DNA replication really only happens during S phase because S stands for synthesis or to make more DNA. So if you've already learned mitosis, basically when we talk about sister chromatids being exact copies, uh, that second like sister, like you have your original chromosome and it's replicated, it's made by this process, DNA replication. And our hopes are at the end of DNA replication that we have two identical strands of DNA. Now I literally copy and pasted here, but this is what we're hoping to build. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how this works. So uh, our rest of our video is be talking about how the DNA replicates. So the double helix, like you can think about someone maybe with curly hair, uh, that double helix, that spiral shape. If you take someone's curly hair and you like not pull on it, but like you like stretch it out and you let it go, the curl will go back. Right. And so we need to kind of help un to untwist or unwind the double helix. So there's a special enzyme called topoisomerase that's going to kind of loosen the DNA and make it a bit easier to start to unzip it. So uh, here we have another enzyme called helicase. So this is DNA helicase and DNA helicase's job is to basically go and break the hydrogen bonds. You can think about it like a zipper and start to separate the strands of DNA. And so here uh, where it's basically like unzipping, we call that the replication fork. So in this uh, animation, the replication fork is going like to the left. So as we continue, a uh, helicase will continue to unzip it in that direction. Okay, so eventually, now this is not, it doesn't unzip all first and then make copies, but in reality, we're trying to like separate the two strands and then those two strands will act as the guide. Like these are the original parent chromosome that we're trying to copy or replicate, and really because of base pairing rules. Now think about it, these original parent strands, if you know G, you know the other side is gonna be a C. If it's a T, well then it'll be an A. And so now based on base pairing rules, we can add the complementary strands. And here, if you were to pause this video, you would see that these are two identical copies of DNA. So when we look at this at the end, the ones highlighted in orange are the new complementary daughter strands. So the original double helix uh, will kind of like open up and act as a template or a guide for the new uh, complementary strands to be built. Uh, so in like S phase of the cell cycle, um, when we make those sister chromatids, this is really what they're made of. They're half original DNA and half new nucleotides being base paired together. All right, so let's go ahead and see how this happens. So we're gonna go back, oops, sorry. Um, oh, we always wanna pay attention too to the five prime and three prime directions, remembering that DNA is anti-parallel. Okay, so our new strands we 
we build will be anti-parallel to these parent strands. Okay, so we're gonna go back to this here. We're gonna see how Dina Helicase um, unzips and breaks those hydrogen bonds. So here we go. We're gonna find if that original parent strand down here is a three. Now our new strand, because it's anti-parallel, is gonna start with a five prime end here. So, and then uh, if one side here is five prime, that means this end of that new strand will be the three prime end. And we know that DNA is built from five prime to three prime, like that is the direction we're going in. Okay, so let's go ahead and see. So here, earlier, we talked about DNA polymerase three as the enzyme that will add new nucleotides to the growing strand. However, there's a little bit of a bummer with DNA polymerase three, and that is that DNA polymerase three is not able to just attach new nucleotides to like nothing. Like it can't just start building and hope the hydrogen bonds will hold it together. So in actuality, we're going to use a different enzyme to start the process. So this enzyme is called primase, and it's going to build a primer. So like uh, if you paint a wall, you might put a primer on first and then the real paint. Or I think for like, I don't wear makeup, but I think there's like a primer and then you put your makeup on or something. And so um, the primer is going to be built first and then we, oh no, I'm blushing. And then we can build the like um, complementary strand. So here you have primase is going to build a primer, but this primer is actually made out of RNA nucleotides. So you can see here, I made the sugar a lighter blue. So that represents a ribose. Now, normally, when we talk about DNA, A would pair with T. However, here I have an A in the DNA. And what I'm going to notice in my primer is that it is a U. A and U will go together. And then here I have a C and a G. So here I have an RNA primer built from like the five prime. And you can see we only added on to the three prime ends. So I would keep adding the next nucleotide to that three prime end. Okay, now this is an issue though on this top strand because the top strand, the five prime to three prime direction is not the same direction as the growing replication fork. Helicase is moving in this direction, but now five to three is in the opposite direction of the replication fork. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so here primase will actually like pick up in the middle of the strand and then put an RNA primer there. And so um, it'll move in the opposite direction of the replication fork. So unlike DNA polymerase 3, primase is able to stabilize RNA nucleotides well enough to begin to attach them. Now, once the primase has built that RNA primer, now DNA polymerase 3 can begin to add the DNA nucleotides. Now it has something to attach to. Okay, so let's go ahead and make some space here. So now DNA polymerase three can come and add DNA nucleotides. You can see that we're adding the next one onto that three prime end. And on the strand we're working on, do you notice that if helicase, was to keep on going. Polymerase three right here, DNA polymerase three, would just follow it and just keep on building, right? This strand would be built continuously. However, the top, the top strand is going to be built in the opposite direction. So DNA polymerase three will add nucleotides, but in the opposite direction of the replication fork. So, the original strand that runs three prime to five prime. So what I'm talking about here is this strand here. Oops. So this strand, this one, um, the original parent strand is a template for the new strand. It's the new strand that's going five to three. The new one, who cares? Like, I, okay, let me be clear and slow down. What I've seen over the years with my students um, they keep in their head, oh, five to three, that's the important one. But I think 
or not I think, what the common mistake is, is that they'll pick like this strand here, five to three, and they'll say, oh yeah, that's the strand that is built continuously. But that's not the case here. It's the strand that looks like has a three and a five allows for this strand here to be built continuously. So this, when a strand, the strand that is built continuously in the five prime to three prime direction that just follows the replication fork, we call this the leading strand. Now that other strand though, up top, is going to be built in fragments. So as helicase continues to move, it opens up a new section that like exposes a new section of DNA. And now new nucleotides can be added, right? And so now once you have that primer, now DNA polymerase three can come and add new nucleotides, but in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so now this strand is built in the opposite direction of the replication fork, and it's built in fragments. We call this strand the lagging strand. So let's just clean this up a little bit. So our strand up top is the lagging strand because it was built in the opposite direction of the replication fork and built in fragments. Whereas the bottom strand, once you had that first primer, it was good to go. It was built continuously in the same direction as the replication fork. So that is the leading strand. Now, uh, you might be thinking, well, first let's talk about this. So in this highlighted blue area, those were our original, our original double helix that we opened up. And then based on base pairing rules, the enzyme DNA polymerase 3 was able to build complementary strands. And if you pause this video, you'll see that these are two identical copies of DNA. These are basically your sister chromatids that were made during S phase. But you might be thinking, hopefully you're thinking about that top lagging strand having R and O. Okay, so here are the fragments. So as that, that top, or in this case, it's the top, it could also be the bottom, uh, but that strand that was built in fragments, those fragments are called Okazaki fragments after the scientist who discovered this process. Okay, so uh, we also have the problem though of these RNA nucleotides. We cannot leave RNA nucleotides in our DNA. So what do we do with them? Well, luckily for us and for all life on Earth, there's an enzyme called DNA polymerase 1. And DNA polymerase 1 will go and it will remove the RNA nucleotides, replacing them with DNA nucleotides. So again, DNA polymerase 1's job is to remove the primers and replace them with DNA nucleotides. Now, on the lagging strand, there'll be multiple fragments, Okazaki fragments, with multiple primers to replace. But on the leading strand, oh, then you have to like seal that bond that we saw earlier. So the enzyme called ligase will form that um, phosphodiester bond to like, like seal the fragments all together once the um, RNA nucleotides have been removed and replaced. So ligase will help out at joining those bonds together. Okay, so now though, let's go ahead and talk about the leading strand. At the very beginning, the leading strand had that RNA primer. So DNA polymerase one will remove it. But just like DNA polymerase three, DNA polymerase one cannot add on to the five prime end. And what you see here, this is, oops, this is the phosphodiester I'm sorry, this is the phosphate group N, which is the five prime end, and it cannot add nucleotides to that five prime end. So now our question becomes, what the heck happens to this gap or this space, right? Okay, so let's summarize what we just learned before we talk more about that pink box area. So DNA polymerase one enzyme, it's an enzyme, removes RNA nucleotides, which are the primers, and replaces them with DNA nucleotides. Then the enzyme ligase will seal these fragments. It builds those phosphodiester bonds between the nucleotides. And on the leading strand, DNA polymerase one cannot add nucleotides to the five prime end. And therefore our chromosomes, they get shorter 
every time a cell replicates. Like legit, every time S phase happens, your chromosomes get a little bit shorter. So there is a limit to how many times cells can divide in your life. Um, this video is already long enough, so I won't go into more detail about tel uh, telomeres, uh, but I encourage you to research them. They're super fascinating. So let's talk about telomeres and the ends of our chromosomes and how they get shorter uh, every time we replicate and how we can protect ourselves. So here we have a, a strand of DNA. And at the end of DNA, there's a region called the telomere. And basically, it's a repeating um, so like a section of repeating nucleotides, T-T-A-A-G-G-G, T-T-A-A-G-G-G. And so they don't code for anything. When I say non-coding, that means it's not coding for my, my, my heritable information, my genes or my genetics. It's just like not important stuff, right? So it's okay if Every time our cell divides, it cuts into that telomere and that telomere gets shorter because it's not important DNA. It's not coding for anything. Uh, you can think of your telomeres as your protective caps on the end of like your shoelaces. You know that those aglets on the end of your shoelace? Um, once that tape or the aglet like gets shorter and shorter over time and your shoelace frays, um, then that could actually get into, uh, then it's like, makes it harder to tie your shoelaces, but in our DNA, uh, once the telomeres are gone, it could cut into now um, your genes and make it hard for your cells to function. Okay, so I just have a couple last slides um, to kind of summarize things. So here, I wanted to point out though, the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So both prokaryotes, which are bacteria and archaeans, and eukaryotes go through DNA replication. But in eukaryotes, we have linear chromosomes, which is basically what I just showed you. But in prokaryotes, bacteria, their chromosome is one circular chromosome. So they actually have like an area uh, that's called the origin of replication. And it's hard to see in this picture, but it's red right here. And that's where like helicase will begin to separate and unzip, and then it can make copies. So it follows the same process with DNA polymerase three and helicase and ligase, et cetera, um, but it is in a circular chromosome, okay? And in eukaryotes, we have linear chromosomes. All right, and then I want you to uh, pause and check yourself here on this image. Could you figure out the leading strand, the lagging strand, the five prime and three prime ends of all parts? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remember that the five prime uh, end, DNA starts out at like to build it, the five prime, and the growing end is the three prime. So I'm gonna look at the end of those green arrows of the new strands being built and realize, oh, that's the three prime end. That's where you can add new nucleotides. That means if that's the three prime end, the other side's the five prime. And I have other sections, other arrows, three prime and five prime, um, and because DNA is anti-parallel, if right here is a five, that means the other strand is anti-parallel is a three prime. And if I follow that all the way through, I would find out five prime here. And this strand is anti-parallel is three. And there you go. Now to find out the leading versus the lagging strand, remember the lagging strand is the one that's built in the opposite direction of the replication fork made of Okazaki fragments. So here on the bottom, we have the lagging strand and up here at the top, we have the leading strand. And then my last slide is because I never actually said these words out loud during my video. Um, and I usually forget each year for some reason, but the process of DNA replication is called a semi-conservative replication. It's semi-conserved or like semi-saved. So we have these original parent strands and when like helicase unzips them and opens them, we uh, each new strand will have a piece of the original parent. That's what I was highlighting in blue in earlier slides. So here we use one side as the guide or the template and we follow base pairing rules to build the complementary strand. So here I would have like my two sister chromatids made during S phase that were half of the original and now half new. And so that's what semi-conservative means. So if I look here at like my sister chromatids, um, you have half the original and then half new. All right, that is it for DNA replication and great job.